St. Nicholas is by far the world's most popular saint. In the Book of Days, which is a calendar of world events published many years ago, it is stated that he probably is venerated by almost as many non-Christians as Christians, and that practically everyone who lives in a civilized country is in some way influenced by this concept. As a historical person, there have been grave misgivings, and but these apply to practically all of the hagiology in the Golden Legend or History of Saints. Actually, he was almost certainly Archbishop of Myra, a Near Eastern Christian community. He was born and lived and died in the 4th century A.D. and gained his reputation for benevolence because it was his conviction, as it is in the case of Mother Teresa, uh, that love, virtue, and religion are related directly to the needs of the needy and to the preservation and distribution of this world's goods among those who are in want. St. Nicholas, unfortunately, therefore, seems to have been removed from the hagiology in recent years, and we don't know just why he should be eliminated. He is certainly not any less historically verified than most of the others in this collection of saints. Some have said that it was because his historicity is doubtful. In other words, there seems to be some question as to whether he existed or not. But as long as people in Italy still venerate his remains, it seems as though there was, must have been somebody there, possibly uh, with that quality if not the exact personality. St. Nicholas was a man of personal wealth. He did not come into religion as a, an outcast or for the forgiveness of some mortal sin. He came of good family and brought with him to his clerical responsibilities a substantial income and a basic economic security. But early in his career, one incident occurred which largely influenced our understanding of his personality. It seems among his parishioners, as at that time Archbishop of Myra, uh, St. Nicholas had in his congregation a very poor but fine man with three young daughters. Now these daughters were approaching marriageable age, but they had no dowry and there was no hope that he could provide any for them. And this meant a very sad and tragic end for these young women in those days. So it came to the attention of St. Nicholas that this was happening. So he got a, his, some of his personal money, put it in the purse, and came at night and threw it through the window into the room where the eldest daughter lived. In the morning, the purse was there with the gold coinage. She was able to pay her dowry, and everything came out well for her. When the second daughter came along, St. Nicholas repeated the same procedure out of his own personal income. And it was rather expensive, but he did it. And when the third one was ready, the father was tremendously impressed and deeply indebted to an unknown benefactor. So he secreted himself in the garden of the house on the night that corresponded to the time when he, then St. Nicholas appeared to the other daughters, and concealing himself, he waited. In due time, St. Nicholas arrived with his third purse, and the father came out and threw himself on his, on his knees before the archbishop. And uh, the, uh, this scene has been dramatized a great many times in various places. And St. Nicholas simply said to the man, Tell no one. This is secret. Make any story you want, but never tell them who did it or where the money came from. And the man promised that he wouldn't. And this began the legend and tradition of St. Nicholas as the secret benefactor, the one who was never known, an invisible person who was always doing good in the world. 
Now, of course, we have all this in our present world living, but are very much concerned over the commercialization of Christmas. And it possible, it's possible that we could understand this a little better when we realize St. Nicholas Day in the, in the calendar of saints was December 6th. He was not the saint of December 25th. The, the 25th was the sacred day of the nativity of Jesus Christ. They are not identical events. And in the old way of custom of celebrating them, they were not united. The, the December 6th is the children's day uh, in the old calendar. It was their day to be receiving presents and all that type of thing. It was the children's time, and uh, much was made of it. Of course, in old days, there were no merchants of consequence. Uh, gifts were usually made by hand, and that was the virtue of them. Uh, there was the secret coming, however, of a good person, a mysterious person who left goodies and sweetmeats and cookies and fruit for the little ones. Uh, in one of my books um, on Japanese lore and legendary, I have a little story, St. Nicholas Nakamura. And uh, while I addressed the story, rearranged it somewhat, I actually saw the performance that I describe in that story, almost word for word, but it didn't happen in a little upstairs room. Actually, that performance was given in the Imperial Theater in Tokyo to an overwhelming house. Thousands of Japanese people came to see the Japanese celebration of Christmas Eve. And it was the same day, the same idea. And the little Japanese person, all fixed up in red and uh, with a white, big white beard and cap, came down the chimney, exactly as I described, and distributed the gifts to the sleeping children. This is everywhere. It is done in Europe, Asia, Africa, everywhere. The question then seems to me to be why that day should be removed from the saint's calendar. Why is a date like that taken out when so many obviously dubious doubt and doubtful personalities are retained in full splendor? The church says that it does not deny the right to venerate St. Nicholas, but it is not obligatory. He is, is not canonical to consider him a saint. But in a non-canonical manner, he may be worshipped without in, without in any way going against the walls, rules and regulations of the church. He is recognized, but not any longer sanctified. And at that time, he is joined by another saint who also lost stature, Saint Christopher. Christopher carrying the Christ child is one of the most ancient of the symbolic religious symbols. The word Christopher itself means the Christ carrier. And that a few days after, he was officially uh, dis disclaimed for the calendar of saints. The sale of Christopher medals doubled. Everyone wanted one because he was the patron saint of calendars, of, of travelers. And as a, as a traveler, everyone belonging certainly to the Catholic de denomination liked to have his medal. So that uh, these shifts and things seem a little unreasonable in the face of our present spiritual needs, that uh, there is a spirit of giving is tremendously important. The, the Bible and the words of Jesus support the tremendous importance of sharing and giving, and that a symbol of this being is being reduced, it seems to me, is unfortunate. Perhaps it lies in a, in a peculiar fantasy that we have developed to the effect that it is more grace, gracious to receive than it is to give. At the present time, everyone wants things, but very few people uh, want to give very much of themselves. They will buy something and suffer all the miseries of commercialization, but still the heart and soul of giving is one of the difficulties that we are facing in modern life. Today, everyone is becoming increasingly self-centered. We want what we want, but there can be a great deal of misery going on around us 
which is unfortunate. We're sorry for it. We donate moderately to the charities. But the great spirit of sharing has gradually disappeared from our modern way of life. We begin to doubt humanity. We doubt our relatives. We doubt our friends. All of the beauty of a con coming together for something of value it seemingly is lost. Now, of course, we don't think of Christmas largely as a merchant's holiday. It is, in fact, it is one of the few occasions in the year in which small business must participate to survive. They depend, as mer many merchants depend upon the Christmas season to keep the store open. And this is, in course, also very unfortunate. So you don't want to say to them, take away all the gift sharing of Christmas. We don't want to say, you take away from children that wonderful morning when everything is something super, supernatural almost is in the atmosphere. But why not go back to the original idea, namely, that gift giving is on December 6th. This is the time. Now in Japan they've solved that problem in another way. I happened to be in Japan one day on Children's Day. We have Father's Day and Mother's Day. Uh, how about having Children's Day or a Family Day or something in which we accomplish what we want to accomplish in sharing? Let children have their Christmas Day, get them the presents, give them to them, do as you please, but separate it entirely from a sacred symbolism the divine mystery of the nativity of Christ. What way we must not continue this way or we're going to lose the whole thing. We are losing more and more of the spiritual overtone in every walk of life. Today there is a reaction against this. For the first time in many years, we see more and more people reclaiming their spiritual heritage or trying to build one in some way and by some appropriate means. But why not do what has been done over there or somewhere else and separate the two occasions? If you declare a children's day, the merchants could do just as well because most of the merchants are not basic, basically concerned with the religious event or what it means. It is an opportunity to supply a need and they are going to meet that need if they can. But if we have a special time set aside for parents and children to get together in sharing as a special sacred symbolic day, if we have a labor day, why not have a family day or a children's day so that people will get together and symbolize their relationships with each other, that parent and child will come to understand better their places in the great plan of things. And by doing this, we will then be free to observe the real sacrament of Christmas. We know also that from the earliest time, Christmas has been associated with the winter solstice. It has been an astronomical mystery that was studied by the ancients on the plains of Babylonia and in the ancient towers of Chaldea. The vernal equinox is the day that is sacred to the Easter season of Christianity. The winter solstice was the time of the annual birthday of the sun. It was so celebrated in Egypt, India, China, Persia, and among the American Indians and the Central American tribes. All of the years began with this winter solstice, the rebirth of the sovereign sun. This rebirth was the symbol of immortality. It was the eternal promise of the regeneration of all that lives. Through the dark years and the months and days of doubt, doubt and tribulation, there was always the hope of the resurrection. And the winter season was actually the annual birth of the solar mystery. This is represented in the monuments of Stonehenge in Britain and Karnak in France. All around the great heaps of rocks in strange mathematical patterns were astronomical symbols. The great pyramids of Giza and other pyramids of Cheops and along the step period pyramids of the Nile, all these were actually astronomical symbols. The great ancient observatories in India are of the same. 
and we find the same also true in China. In other words, we have a symbolism of an old man with an hourglass being led away by a little child. And the old man is the old year that has just come to an end. And the little child is the new year, the hope of eternity. Therefore, each year we receive a strange and wondrous gift, the gift of renewed opportunity, the gift of new hope, the gift of the possibility of the fulfillment of the best that is in us, the opportunity to, to grow more, to share better, to understand with greater depth the mystery of our own existence. We are therefore much concerned with the winter solstice in that it brings, brings to us the realization that that is the moment that separates the past from the future. The past is done. Its debts must be paid in due time. But the future is always in the making. And each new year is a new chance to perfect the world, to complete the project, to fulfill the need, to make new resolutions and new convictions about what to do and how to do it. This is the time when, in ancient days, the great leaders of peoples gathered in sacred and secret sessions in order to discover the gift that they could bestow upon their own citizens, the gift of better living conditions, of more sanitation, of food and clothing, and most of all, of an inner life by which they could be strengthened to meet the needs of daily existence. In our rush of things, we have gradually weakened the inner life of millions of people. They no longer have faith in themselves. They no longer trust others. They no longer look forward to the promise of a new year. It has come to the point now where a new year is merely a new opportunity for hazard and tragedy. These things are wrong. They are morally wrong. And yet they, the historian would be able to prove conclusively that his most morbid convictions are correct. But that which has been does not necessarily have to be in the future. This time the winter solstice could be a dividing line between old mistakes and new virtues to correct faults of the past and bring the gifts and treasures of new resolution to a world in need. At this moment, we are in a, the most complicated situation, probably, that civilization has ever known. The 20th century has been the most destructive in the history of the world. No, at any time, in spite of all the tribulations and sorrows and wars that we have had in the past, have we ever come to the same condition of complete in insecurity with which we are now afflicted. Something has to be done about it. But we can't do anything by taking away from people their ideals or diminishing their faith or reducing their convictions about value and purpose. We cannot help anyone unless we help them to help themselves, to find themselves. And by digging deeper into themselves, find the sacred spirit which alone can command their respect and their obedience. So we need definitely every symbol we can have that inspires the individual to be a better person. We need good laws. We need good education. We need idealism and integrities so that we can build the kind of world that we know is right and proper instead of going on year after year in these turmoils and confusions with which we are now afflicted. There is coming up among us now many new organizations of one kind or another that are dedicated to trying to find a solution uh, to the grand problem, a solution that is workable, possible, a solution that does not require a miracle except the miracle of a better hope. We need more and more understanding of the requirements of this new viewpoint. And in the early uh, church, particularly in the Near Eastern branches of Christianity, there were many ideas and ideals that would be well worth remembering in this time where we are searching so desperately. The ba basic concept of early religion was to give. 
and gradually this has changed a little it is to gain. The Lord has no place to lay his head. We build cathedrals and are locked in war and dissension. Therefore, it is necessary to realize the inner mystery of the human soul, that medicine for the present ill must come from within us. It cannot be bestowed upon us from the outside. We cannot be better simply by learning the facts of life. The only good these facts can do is inspire us to live them. If we do not live what we know or believe or discover, then knowledge in itself is a futile effort to accumulate uh, ideas and wisdom and learning. Actually, therefore, there is gradually coming into prominence among people today a definite search uh, for a solution that works, a solution that escapes commercialism, a final realization that we cannot buy salvation, a final realization that no matter what we have, we are still the slaves of what we are. The only correction that is possible is internal. The individual has to be inspired to a better way of life. Now, we can help to inspire him. We can give him opportunities to see or understand better things. In art and music and literature, we can inspire him. We can give him faith a little bit in his own power to grow. But the growing he must do himself. He must do as the Buddhist philosophy has taught from the beginning. He must take every step in the path of his own redemption for himself. No one else can take a single step for him. But somebody may stand behind him or in front of him and help him to make that step. But he must do it himself. And so it is in this great redemption program that the world is working with at the present time. No matter how many reforms we legislate, no how many offices we create, or how many laws we enact, the solution to our problem lies definitely within ourselves. It lies within that part of ourselves which has gradually been neglected. Partly the part that is religion, which is the spiritual communion of the individual with something superior to himself. Part is in family, where once the family was the sacred institution, where all worked together for a common good. Now these families are scattered about and break up almost as quickly as they are formed, many of them at least. Then we find that now the exploitation of our vices. We find that everything we do wrong becomes business for someone else. And little by little we are contaminated by our own weaknesses which are more and more profitable to those who are most dangerous to our survival. Narcotics, alcohol, all these things are exploited. Everything is profit. We need another kind of profit, one that brings tidings of better things to come and better states that are. Therefore, it is up to us as persons to begin to do these things that are necessary. It is one thing to accept a doctrine and another thing to live it. We can say an individual should be honest, but unless this is something that makes us honest, even as we think about it, nothing changes in society. We all, each, each one of us seems to feel that he is uniquely privileged to do as he pleases. If he wishes to dislike, he has a right to do so, even though he may proclaim himself to be an intensely religious person. So the religious individual, as we know him now, is full of the same faults as those who have no religion. It is quite possible to be a kind of spiritual materialist, one in two talks of faith, can document faith, but does not live it. So these all call for very careful thinking now in this particular time when we are coming into one of the most critical periods in the history of our country and of the world in which we live. It is coming to the point now where faith must find its way into our personal lives. And in a sense, we need a kind of St. Nicholas in ourselves. We need a spirit of generosity, a spirit of great gratitude, we need to have something which is appealing to us as children. 
We are all children. Those are the only ones who have grown up are so uncomfortable about it that we don't want to equate it or do anything like it. We want to be children. We want the open eyes, the open laughter, the open hearts of children. We want to do the nice things of life. We want to take care of our loved ones. We want to see that the hungry are fed and, and the ruthless have a shelter of some kind. We want to be more and more conscious of the needs of each other and less conscious of our own bank accounts. And yet this doesn't change. In fact, in spite of the uh, thousands of editions of the Bible, selfishness is greater today probably than ever before in history. Selfishness is a means of survival in a materialistic atmosphere. And yet this very materialistic atmosphere, dominated by the selfishness of people, is bringing about the tragedy that we fear. We fear the breakdown of our own social society. We fear the breakdown of our own sense of values. We realize the need of building more prisons when we already have more than they ever had in the world before. We are constantly under the threat of war, under poverty, unemployment. Uh, we are seeing more and more corruption on every level of living from the highest to the lowest. And yet, with all that, we must go on. And the only way that we can go on is to realize that evils are on the outside, but there is an eternal good on the inside. And it is this eternal good that we must turn to, this et internal good that we must strengthen if we are to survive. Each person must work out his own salvation with diligence. There is no other way. We cannot save each other, but we can make it easier for each individual to save himself. We cannot do the growing for another person, but we can protect that person while he is growing and give him the advantages and the privileges which he needs. To do this, we've got to change the point of view from that of forever receiving to the point of view of forever giving and sharing. Our whole economy today, the answer to it is must be, how much can we give? How much can we afford to make at the expense of each other? And that isn't too much in these days, with the population of the world reaching six billion, with our natural resources dwindling, we are considering ourselves to be enlightened because we invent computers and, and explore space and find new chemical dyes and compounds and do various remarkable things. We are not progressing. We are becoming more complicated, more dependent. And uh, we are great, making great inventions, inventions that could be of the greatest value, but we immediately pervert them distort them, turn them to some selfish end rather than permit them to do their service to humankind. I think that St. Nicholas has been always represented as a spirit of giving. And uh, I remember when a child asked me once, uh, where does St. Nicholas get all these things he give us, gives us? How does he know what we want? All these little thoughts and so forth require a kind of fairy tale to be answered in uh, some symbolic manner. But the truth of the matter is that secret giving is a privilege that we all have. We can all do things that are gracious. I had a friend come in not too long ago who was having domestic trouble, very much in difficulty. They have joined a church recently, and I am greatly hoping that this new affiliation will give them the courage and wisdom to live better. And so this problem came up of the particular disadvantage or difficulty which the person was suffering from, an antagonism, an animosity that was deep set over a period of many years. I said to this person, will this new religious affiliation permit you to reconcile this? Can you honestly say that you're over it? The person said, no. We just don't touch that point at all. We're going to do all we can to be good, but we're not going to change our dislike to the person who has grieved us or done something we don't want. We won't stop gossiping because we'll have nothing to talk about if we do. All these things uh, tell us that the individual is searching for something better 
but he's holding desperately to the ills he has known all his life to continue and perpetuate these types of things. And all this becomes part of his, of his journey through the world. Now, St. Nicholas in Europe was never just what we have here. St. Nicholas in Europe was often symbolized by a clerical figure. It's very often St. Nicholas of Santa Claus or Chris Kringle wore the robes of a prelate. He was a priest with a croisered staff and a mitre. He came as a spirit to people and he brought, him, he brought with him gifts. But these gifts were for the most part homemade. In Europe, no one in, in the older days would consider a bought gift because a bought gift is something anyone can do. But if you sit down and you weave a garment or you do an embroidery or you carve something yourself or you paint something, these things are gifts of you to someone else. They carry you. They are not mechanical. They are not made by the million. They are something that you have prepared over a period of time for someone you love, someone you care for, someone you wish to make happy. This was the way it was in the times of old St. Nicholas. There's a story that the, uh, there was a nunnery near where he lived, and uh, it was part of the ritual of that time that on this day, the 6th of December, the sisters put their shoes or sandals outside their door at night. And in the night, St. Nicholas came and put some fruit, walnuts, or some little symbol in each slipper. This was the gift. Later, uh, some of the people in the early 8th and ninth centuries already hung up stockings. And it was later, but not too far after that, that the idea that he came down the chimney took form and shape. But these were all devices to signify an explanation for a very simple fact, and that is secret giving. Instead of saying, I gave it to you, uh, to the child, it was rec recognized as a gift of the divine to the human. It was, it was really secret giving because it came from a secret level of yourself, not from the outside personality that carried the pocketbook, but something inside of you was a secret giver. And in life, something inside of each of us is the secret source of good for those we care for, for those we believe in, for those we hope will be happy. So that Santa Claus represents a spirit of generosity in ourselves. It's something in which for a moment we forget what we want and what we would like and what we demand of life to help someone to be happy. What is the greatest joy that we can bestow upon another person? The answer probably is happiness. What is happiness? Is happiness the new, new fur coat or the new car or things of that kind? No. Happiness has nothing to do with what you have. It has to do with what you are. It is a fulfillment of inner need. Happiness is being at peace with yourself and looking out upon a good world which you can understand or upon a problem which you can bless because it is going to in, in the end be of value to you. All the happiness therefore comes not from what you have but from an inner sense of, of safety, an inner sense of unity with life, an inner sense of being one family upon a little ball floating strangely in space. We have here a, a problem that we're going to have to face more and more. We can't move out of this environment very well. <clears throat> the idea that we may civilize another planet is still rather too remote to be considered important. We are here on a little molehill which we are outgrowing very rapidly. We have less and less land. We have to destroy more and more in order to survive. The very earth and the elements are polluted. We are constantly creating unnecessary the problems and causing suffering to each other. We are making more and more munitions in at the same time crying for peace. Actually, we are wearing out the world as we know it 
and the patience of whatever that creating power is, which has to be God, the only being in the universe that has no limitation upon patience. Patience is a virtue perfected in deity. Deity waits and will wait until the time comes. Deity will win. In the meantime, however, we get ourselves into a lot of trouble. And we are watching and we are not doing a thing about it. We are not teaching our school children. We are taking away from them their faith. We are, our educational system emphasizes the reality and inevitability of crime. Our entertainment is mostly the dramatization of crime and delinquency. Our literature is largely commercialized to the point that truth is sacrificed to saleability. Practically everything we have is compromised and in, de developed and directed for profit. As, though, as this goes on, we can get in trouble because there just isn't enough of everything to do what we're doing with it now. There isn't enough clear air. There isn't enough clear earth. There is not enough clear water. All these things must be conserved instead of wasted. But in order to conserve the resources of our planet, we must overcome our own selfishness and self-interest. We want everyone to economize except ourselves. We want to continue to do as we please, waste as we please, and worry as we must. All this is something that around this season of the year we should give a little thought to. We should realize that regardless of all the schemes, plans, legislations, and legal patterns that we set up, that the actual problem is to learn to respect one another, to learn the hope, faith, and love are the only solutions to the human dilemma. Until our faith is strong enough to change our conduct, nothing will change. And if only when our love expands to include all that is necessary for the security of the whole world will our love be a medicine against the ills of the day. There is no way in which we can continue to be self-centered without becoming ultimately self-destructive. Now, when we say self-destructive, we don't mean that the individual who fails is going to cease. But he's going to carry forward with him the karma of his own conduct. He is going to continue to perpetuate here and hereafter the problems of his own nature. He must come back again and face what he has caused. And it would be much nicer if he could come back to a world that is already better because he has made it better before he left. We have now in the next 10, 20 years, most people have had a good reasonable life expectancy. It would be a good plan to sit down very carefully and look yourself over and look inside. See just what's in there. See what you might consider to be your greatest virtue. Are you cheerful in, the, in times of trouble? Are you inclined to avoid responsibility? Do you hate easily? Do you give and forgive slowly? Do you have anybody in your life, anywhere, living in this world whom you cannot who you would not invite to your home do you know anyone God is gone who is remembered only as a negative and destructive memory go through these different things and weed out the attics and basements get rid of all these things that prevent the individual from growing and becoming better and in this way helping to build a better world for everyone the world's happiness is vested in each individual citizen. Uh, Confucius said, the security of the empire depends upon the integrity of the home. Do we have solid homes? Why do we not have them? It's largely because we do not want the responsibility of them. We want all the fun and none of the work. We want to avoid and evade the responsibilities and obligations of maturity. And what happens? The trouble sets in, and little by little, we find our own personal securities swept away because of the collective destruction. 
Now, the, the saints became symbols of those persons who were martyred for, because of their dedication to good. We have an excellent reputation for destroying our benefactors. Most of our great teachers have been persecuted. Many of them have been executed. And many others have been simply ignored or ridiculed. We have very little gratitude for anyone or anything that invites us to grow. We do not want to grow by effort. We want to grow by miracle. Now this brings the religious problem strongly into focus, and I think we should mention it. Namely, that there is no trick by means of which you can escape the normal responsibilities of life. You cannot intellectualize your way out of your own conduct. You cannot follow some system that makes it unnecessary for you to improve yourself in order to become a better person. You cannot buy perfection. You must earn it. You cannot buy maturity of insight. It cannot be transmitted by printed page or by voice. It has to be inspired by a devout and honest effort to grow. And when we learn something better and we know it's better, we must live according to it. Unless we put the living part in, we gain nothing. Those who would know the doctrine must live it every day. The problem of intellectualizing a problem, solving it without touching the misfortunes of our personal convictions, is just not possible. Everyone who wants to be better has got to be the better in conduct. This is something that is again escaping us because we've been accustomed to buying everything. We buy insurance, we buy cars, we buy homes, we buy elaborate presents and gifts, and we expect to buy salvation. Well, it hasn't been sold yet and probably never will be because it represents something so completely above and beyond any financial estimation that it is not possible to think in terms of buying our way out of our problems. We can learn all we want to, but everything we learn must change us. If it remains simply in the mind of something remembered, it does no good. It is only valuable when it inspires a major improvement in personal conduct. Most of those who are trying today to find answers to their problems are, find, are hunting because of desperation. They're already in trouble. They're already utterly confused. They do not know what to do next. So they're reaching out. Unless these seekers actually change their own ways, there is no hope that anyone else can grow for them or bestow maturity upon their own immaturity. Today we have problemed greatly with the need for religion for young people. We have created a code by which religion is persecuted, not necessarily by an inquisition, but persecuted by penalty. We are not taught religion because it interferes with the development of our materialistic concepts. We are not going to be given religious instructions because it might cause us to forget the importance of making money. We are not going to be given religion because ethics makes us unemployable. And uh, there is no penalty for doing wrong. There is only a minor dist dist distress if we are caught. The great problem, therefore, is as long as the system itself is completely unreasonable in the face of nature, we are not going to be able to cultivate any virtue that will not interfere with the perpetuation of the problem we're in. And yet we want to change the situation. We want to get over the problem, but we don't want to take chances that it's going to penalize us as individuals. So we here are working on this situation of trying to get an idealism to children. Now the answer seems to be coming in a little different way from what we expected. It's the children that are speaking up. More and more the children are asking for help. They're asking for a help that can only be given to them in one way, 
and that is by the disciplining of life and character. We are faced with juvenile suicides. We are faced with all kinds of juvenile crime and delinquency, juvenile adult, a juvenile and adult drug addiction. All these things are being brought to our attention. There are already moves are being made by the young people themselves to wipe out drug addiction. We won't do it. We're too busy or too indifferent. But the children themselves, seeing their own friends collapse, are going to do what apparently the great world of political pressures will not undertake. We are gradually going to find on, out of our sorrows the answers to our questions. Now in a few years we'll be into a new century. More people today are interested in peace than ever before in history. And that is proper. And little by little the extraordinary examples of corruption will destroy corruption. This is our hope and it's nature's way of operating. Now all along the line we have this problem of the little child leading Father Time into the future. Father Time is not only uh, Santa Claus, so to say, but also it is the Greek and Egyptian god Cronus or Saturn. Saturn, the ancient god, represents eternal law that cannot be broken. Saturn is, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. Saturn is the past always moving forward into the future, but it is being guided into the future by a small child. For all laws that uh, exist in nature uh, are finally brought to fulfillment by the hearts of children. The child, uncontaminated, is the hope of the future. Therefore, it is necessary that that hope be nourished and chased, watched, carefully guarded, protected against the corruptions of the time. We should be giving much more attention to children and in their education and their spiritual enlightenment. We have now today at least five major religions. These religions are scattered. Most of them are very strong. The strongest, of course, are actually Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and the philosophical idealism of China under the teachings of Confucius and Lhotse. There are many others, however. All of these religions are united in one principle, namely the importance of personal conduct. And most of them at the present time are at war with themselves and each other. Today, the peace that should come from religion is being destroyed by conflicts between creeds and sects. We are allowing these differences to destroy our confidence in religion and our respect for it. We find fanaticism, we find activism, we find all kinds of selfishness and commercialization passed off in the name of religion. This is itself is wrong. But it's because we have built these towering structures over an empty foundation. We have not recognized that no religion can do for us from the outside but what we must do for ourselves from the inside. And yet we do not know how to look for it inside. We have certain beliefs and certain convictions, but we also have to realize the importance of the thought that has come down from the past. Be still and know that I am God. Somewhere stillness is important in this. Stillness is not the rankling of creeds. Stillness is the silent contemplation of values. Actually, peace arises in a very simple human way. It is the instinctive love of the parent for child. It is the instinctive recognition that we are most happy when we serve that which we admire, love, or cherish. These things are all opportunities to express, to give forth from ourselves something. We are happier when we have a job than when we have an income. We do not want the leisure because we do not contribute. We want to do something. 
In a world in which there are millions of things to do, many people can't do anything but sit four or five hours every evening in front of a television, contributing nothing and receiving nothing, a little, just a little bit of value out of all this watching. These people would be happier if instead of listening and watching, they were doing. Something has to be done. Something has to be created. Everything that we do in life has to have some kind of meaning, or it becomes an infinite boredom. In one way, of course, our fathers and ancestors took care of this was very simple. On day after St. Nicholas Day, when the gifts had all been distributed, the family settled down, settled down to prepare for the next St. Nicholas Day. The loom was put back, the embroidery needles were found again, the wood carvers got the back, the furniture makers got at it, and the weavers and everyone was at it, ready for the next session. And this next session was something that really was very well worthwhile. A number of years ago, I spent a Christmas in, South, in Rouen, in Normandy. It was a, on a, in a home of a friend of mine. And they had a family on the property that lived in. And this family uh, came from the Norman peasantry. The place in Rouen, where Joan of Arc was burned at the stake, was only a few miles away. On Christmas Eve, there was the great exchange uh, the owner of the house uh, prepared to receive the guests, his own servants. He was paying them well. There was no problem of that nature. But he put on his very best clothes. And he put on his very best tablecloth and got out for the French the highest gift of all, his best bottle of wine. And he prepared and had other people prepare this dinner for the retinue that was to come in. And among the, the, those present, of course, there was also his favorite small dog who had a very special uh, dinner prepared for it also. In due time, the, visit, the guests arrived, typical Norman pels, peasants. Uh, each one dressed completely in black, man and woman, black from head to foot. <coughs> Uh, black shoes, greased for the occasion, everything in perfect order and great, great sedateness and great silence. They came in in a row and sat down as though they were entering a pew at church. They sat perfectly quiet, looking straight ahead. There wasn't a smile, there wasn't a glimmer, there wasn't anything that might be, be synonymous as far as that's concerned. Then at the proper moment, uh, little gifts were bestowed, things of no value to speak of, but were received with great decorum, great appreciation, all this sort of thing. And finally, it kind of loosened up a little bit, and they all joined in this very good dinner. And before the dinner was over, the uh, Lord of the Manor uh, had won again his, his retinue they regarded him no longer as the lord of the manor, but as one like themselves. He shared exactly in what they did, gave what they gave, received what they received, and encouraged and inspired, and for that evening, all was equality. Then after it was all over, everyone was content, the little dog was asleep from overeating, the retinue filed out in the most complete reticence and silence and return where it had come. This was the great occasion of the year. This was that moment in which walls and boundaries were all down, where the parlor was the same for the servant and the master, and everyone shared equally in the festivity of the occasion. Had it been any other way, it would have been a dismal failure, for this was the way it had been in Normandy for a thousand years. And there was something about it that showed that the little things about Christmas, which uh, to them uh, were really sacred, the uh, a carol, very definitely in French, a prayer by an elder, and few things of this nature that made it all seem 
part of a timeless way of exchange and intercourse between people. So that was a, it was a very pleasant occasion because it was very quiet, very serious, very sincere, and yet there was something about it that went through all the barriers of civilization and culture, and everyone was equal, and everyone was happy, and everyone bent back to waiting, hopefully, for the next year. This had been going on in that family for 15 years when I lived there. Everyone was happy, peaceful, quiet. No vast exchanges of wealth, no expectation of it. Just simply to be together and have a little uh, gentle re reunion on a level of absolute equality. And this was the same thing as happened in Rome. For in the certain of the festivals in Rome, the master of the house served his own servants, waiting on them at table. These, this mingling of values was very important. It was part of a symbolism that there is a great equality and that this equality must be made to grow greater. These, must, these things must not be forgotten. They must be strengthened. They must be enlarged. They must be made more powerful in the life of each individual if we're ever going to solve any of the problems that really worry us in life. So now we're coming up to another Christmas, another visit from old St. Nicholas. And uh, as many children have explained it, it's very hard to know how there's so many of them because there's one in every toy department. There's one on every street corner nearly. But they all symbolize one thing. The little old man with the baggy red suit and the white whiskers represents charity, which in the Bible is done, uh, is built into the word charitas, which means to give. And in the new, in the King James Version, it has gradually been changed to love. It is some way a concern which is hard to determine, a concern for those who need, with Santa Claus taking from the rich and giving to the poor, with Santa Claus bestowing all kinds of gifts and causing all kinds of strange things. But the children who receive these gifts, by the time they're five years old, don't believe in Santa Claus much anymore. But what they should believe in is the idea behind it, namely that there are people in the world who want to make them happy. And they want to have them enjoy life and have the fulfillment which perhaps has been denied to their own parents. It isn't just the fact that there is a fabled Santa Claus. It is the spirit of sharing. But the gifts themselves must be something significant. They can't just be something that is broken and thrown away the next day. It has to be a sharing of inner life and inner principle. It must be a giving of the most precious of all things, love and insight. And these, uh, the, today we have more neglected rich children than ever before in the history of the world. It is no longer just simply that the poor can't afford it. Surely the poor are with us always. Christ said so. But there are a great many very wealthy children who are poorer than the poor. There are a great many loveless children who have been unloved and never learned to love. All of this is part of a fallacy that has gradually dawned on us along with the mechanical age and efficiency and airplanes and space flights. Everything that is real is being sacrificed. So you have to say to yourself, in order to discover reality, there is one test. Only nothing is real that you cannot take with you when you leave here. And this is a very important test. And it eliminates most of the things as which we are willing to sacrifice life and honor. <clears throat> we can't g gain eternal value. We can't be happier unless we are able to have values that are stronger than death that are stronger than time, that endure with faith. We have to recognize the importance of permanence in homes, of uh, understanding between labor and capital, and of the respect and uh, understanding of the problems of governing a nation. 
all these things must be none must be known by people who love to find realities who want to support what is right but uh, do not simply wait until they can condemn something that isn't all these things mean that we've got to change the tune change the tone of things and here comes Christmas now with our little Santa Claus all around the merchants doing very well in spite of the collapse of the stock market which is a little symptom by the way of the facts of life that Santa Claus isn't going to die because the stock market broke down something may change we may have to find a new way to allow him to control our lives more but these values will endure and the values of which he represents or which he represents will live regardless we are all going to find the ultimate joy in giving the ultimate happiness for what we do for others instead of what others do for us somehow we got our civilization backwards we've done it built it into an all wrong pattern there are very few things that can be done for us that will help, help to make us happy that we couldn't do for others and help to make them happy but we are all self-centered we want what we want and we do not really care very much what others get if any actually unless we care more for others than we do for ourselves our civilization must fall we cannot build a security upon selfishness we cannot endure and succeed on patterns of competition and self-interest long ago our early American socialists declared that we must definitely recognize that selfishness competition is the death of trade cooperation alone can permit a civilization to grow cooperation in religion means various denominations having respect for each other we are we were we are, we remember from the history books the horrors of the inquisition and the terrors of the crusades and yet today we have holy wars involving half the people of the earth almost the lovers of peace are fighting to the death therefore with this all this instruction with this moral uh, realization Santa is bringing a large bundle of facts for us to think about the greatest gifts that he can bestow this Christmas is to open our eyes to the real reality and values that come to us from the tragedies and trials of our own experiences if Santa Claus brings us the key to our own problem if Santa Claus brings us an answer to our own selfishness in one way or another expanding our insights deepening our understanding and strengthening our idealism then Christmas will be great Christmas will be great if it, bring, if it <coughs> reminds us of something if it recalls the greatness of things if it does what it did for the Romans 2,000 years ago it reminded them of a beautiful earth with flowers and plants and, fl and all, all kinds of creatures a beautiful world of opportunity a world that is a garden and which we are gradually changed into a graveyard by our own misdemeanors so if Sandy brings us this year a little love a little bundle of understanding a little more of hope a little more resolve to do those things which will most advance our own lives and the lives of those we love it will be indeed a very valuable and important Christmas it will be a Christmas that will not be easily forgotten if it's the one when for the first time we give ourselves with our gifts rather than give the gift and keeping ourselves this is beautifully represented in a famous poem the vision of Sir Longfall in which the giver must be there or the gift is meaningless all these things are coming and we read the paper every day and every day there is a new disillusionment and we say to ourselves there is nothing we can trust if we realized that there never was anything we can trust except the uh, integrity 
There's nothing we can trust unless, as individuals, we understand life, know what is trustworthy, and do not mistake illusions for realities, and do not mistake selfishness as a cardinal virtue, which it is not. So this, they are upset. Maybe we, some families will have to cut down a little on the gifts. They may not be able to get a new car or something this year. But if they stay home and understand each other, here is a great gift. If we can find ways in which answers come to long delayed questions, long overlooked problems, if the family that is a little rocky decides this year that it's going to get stable, that we're going to think a little less about each one but a little more about the family as a group, if a family is about to break up, now may be the time to mend it and put it together again. It can be put together. It's selfishness and arrogance and suspicions are overcome. Also, if we, if we expect virtues, we are much more apt to find them. It is when we doubt, we doubt and finally it comes to a point where nobody really cares. These things have been growing worse and worse. Now, when the, uh, I think Christmas also, I think another point is valuable. So it's in the Christmas celebrations to this year, when you, whenever you go or whatever you do, recognize the communion that is involved in this sacrament. Christmas must be also a sacrament. It is a moment of realization in a lifetime of uncertainties. It is a moment of recognition and dedication and of gratitude for the wonders and beauties of life that we have probably overlooked and ignored. When they, everybody sits down for a big Christmas dinner, there should be something come out of it besides indigestion. There should be something more valuable, something more important. I think it would be very wise to have some kind of a little service in your own home, at the dinner table perhaps, two minutes of dedicated and devout gratitude for the fact that we live in a world where we can do something worthwhile if we want to, where we can help to make things better or leave them as they are, where we can find opportunities to improve the lives of people we know, where we can be closer to our children or our grandchildren or the neighbor's children, that we can do all kinds of things which are privileges and which we have neglected because we've interpreted them as hard work. The hardest of all work is a life devoted to selfishness. There's no reward. There's nothing in it. So in the connection with Christmas, let us bear a little bit about the thought that we have been given on the winter solstice, the privilege of another year another lease on the life of our own kind, a life that is limited, a life that must begin and end. But we have another opportunity to grow. We have an opportunity to, do, to give something to the service of other people. We have an opportunity to be kind. We have some time in which to learn useful things. And it's not necessary for us to escape on the grounds that if it's any good, it's work. If it's no good to anybody, it's pleasure. This is the type of thing that we have to change. We also have to maybe try and see if we can do a little secret giving to those we know are in real need. Something to give is far better than what we get. All around us now, people are gathering for this type of thing. They're beginning to realize what we've known from the beginning, but no one wanted to believe, that the way of materialism is bad, sad, cruel, and worthless in its larger meaning. There is nothing we can do to the outside world that will do more good than to protect it from our own inroads. We can't add something to the substance of nature but we can damage our own participation in that substance by our attitudes and conduct. So this Christmas, a little understanding of life, that we have maybe another year, maybe another 10 years, maybe 50 years, 
a further life in this world. Years that should be depending upon the circumstances, but by which we have an opportunity to do something that is valuable. Something that will make life better for people. If we don't know what to do because we work and we do the best we can, let us make sure that we are doing a good job of what we are doing. That we, that we don't just hate our job and, and worship only the paycheck. That we really put ourselves to earning what we get instead of hoping that we'll get it for nothing or cutting down on quality in order to increase profit. We can clean up all those little things. Then we can look over, over carefully the problems of our personal lives. We have hours, uh, many hours, in which to do things. In spite of our feelings on the Muslim question at the present moment, we remember Muhammad's 24-inch rule. We have 24 hours in every day, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest and repose, and eight hours for service. And this is the type of life that is valuable and can be doing something. We can increase knowledge, we can contribute to various causes, we can do part-time voluntary work with causes we believe in, or we can improve our natures so that we become more useful in the employments where we are. There's something to do besides waste time. We have become the greatest time wasters of all history because we have created a vast entertainment world which is not very entertaining, in which we escape from responsibility into something that is little better than nothing. This uh, idea of looking for entertainment to escape from self is not good. If we, have, if we were more critical on these points, we'd get better entertainment. We would have things we really want to see or places we really want to go. But simply to go and work for a number of years, retire on Social Security, and consider ourselves to be fortunate when we don't have to work anymore is an illusion. It's the most terrible illusion of all. We're only happy when we're doing something useful, something constructive, something that helps others or improves ourselves as useful citizens. So let's hope that uh, the, that old Saturn or Cronus, old Father Time, when he, when he turns away and turns the world over to the little grandson who is going to follow him, that this new year that is so close to us now is going to be the beginning of the greatest reformation the humanity has ever known, the final exhaustion of self-interest the final recognition of the fallacy of success as we know it. That instead of this type of thinking, and this type of building, we're going to get together and try to make this world back again once more into the garden that it was. A beautiful place to come into, a fine place to live, and a wonderful memory when we go. These things could be, there can be a heaven on earth, there can be a beautiful world here, and it can hold many more people than we have even now, if we didn't abuse it, if we didn't try to own it, if we didn't try to subdivide it, if we did not try to cheat each other out of some small part of it. If we could be build back the golden age, we would surely have the new Atlantis. We would have a world in which knowledge and skill would be used for the common good, where everything that is necessary to man would be available to man without great financial tragedies. That it would not be necessary to buy what is necessary for survival. That the individual would not have to be wealthy in order to stay healthy. That it is absolutely part of a great program. It was part of the entire dream of the ancients back as far as Solon, who was educated in Egypt, that the day was going to come when mankind would restore the world into the beauty that it was, the dignity that it was, and the magnificent opportunity that it affords for the growth and happiness of all the creatures that inhabits it. That's all has to come, and that's what maybe 
Santa Claus is bringing a little of that news and that their old sack of his, giving us a little more courage. If, if this Christmas reminds us that there is a God, if this Christmas reminds us that there have been beautiful and wonderful servants of God, that there have been great teachers in this world to whom we owe a great deal, there have been very many, many faithful little people who have worked and suffered and struggled and given the full measure of devotion to the smaller lives which they have lived. They are just as much heroes as the greatest names in history. Wherever anyone is right, there is a star in the earth as it's like a star in heaven. So we must all try to gain something of this in order to open the new century when it comes. Not as a century in which some great mystery occurs and the heavens open and the celestial choirs appear, but a simple work in which people with reasonable talents take over the development and protection of their environment. It is up to each person to protect the rights of all others to protect his own. And until this is generally recognized, exploitation will continue without interruption and there will be no real security anywhere in the world. So the Santa Claus, maybe this year, brings a message. A message which is like the message of old St. Nicholas of Myra. The message of secret help, the secret giving, that in one way or another we are going to be a little better and we're not going to claim any credit for it and we're not going to say to someone, look how good I am or parade our virtues, but by quietly doing what is necessary, we will save our world. We must save it one by one. And we will have to all work together. And as soon as the momentum starts, we're going to discover that this, the correction of our ills is not nearly as difficult as we thought it was going to be. It is much more difficult to do wrong than it is to do right. But we don't realize that. So then the, the Christmas time this year, the little man in the red suit can be a symbol of our own conscience. It can be something of our own love and in our hearts. Perhaps a blazing symbol of a divine power in ourselves. Santa Claus in our own hearts becomes the bestower of all good to all whom we know and all whom we will meet and understand and contact in the course of the year. So we hope that you'll all think about these things and remember how important this really is to the future of humanity. Also, I want to thank all of you who have been so kind and generous and have sent me some wonderful cards and gifts and things of that nature. We will acknowledge as many as we can, but we're rather short-handed, and therefore let me thank you all here for what you have done and for your patience through this rather difficult health period for which uh, I'm not especially proud, but there it is. But anyway, we'd like you to know that we appreciate everything that you do to help to carry on this work, which is now, now carrying on into, my, into 68 years of active public work. So we thank you for that. I'd like to also call your attention that uh, we have taken over the publication and distribution of two of my wife's books. One is the uh, story of her adventures in connection with Bruton Vault, and the other is the riddle of the Shakespeare Sphinx. These are now available in full printed form, and uh, the first book is about 600 pages, so you really find out what happened in Williamsburg. And the second one is very interesting because it calls upon a great many sources of knowledge concerning the early foundation of this country from books not generally noted or referred to, which I might happily say, some of which are in our own collection. So we hope you will visit the book table and see these. And we thank you all for being with us. And we wish you a blessing for the coming year. And we hope that you will all be with us and we will be with you for several years yet to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>